this is yours, okay? This is mine. All right. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see your smiling faces. It always is. Got a nice turnout here today, and uh, that just brings glory to God. And um, we want you to know that you're here because God intended you to be here for a reason. Uh, I don't even know what this man's going to preach on, but it's from the Word. And if it's from the Word, we need to hear it. The wonderful thing about God's Word, though, is sometimes it'll hit two different people two different ways. So God knows you since he made you, and he knows what you need. He knows you need to be ministered to in some way or another. Maybe it's nothing serious. Maybe you just need to feel the love of God just wrap around you from the preaching of his word. Whatever it is, though, if you're not open to it, if you're not willing to receive it, then you might pass up and miss out on something life-changing. Because every time the word of God is preached, it's life-changing. So a few announcements here. We uh, <clears throat> still have firewood out there. Uh, if anybody needs it or knows someone who needs it. <clears throat> we are, because of weather, we ended up not having a Wednesday night dinner this month, but we'll try to resume that next month on the second Wednesday of the month. But this, uh, the 30th of this month, the last Sunday, as usual, we're going to have a potluck after we have the Lord's Supper. So you all start thinking. That's, uh, that's a week from today. All right, so cooks, get your recipe books out and whatever else. We need to have one of them big throwdowns. Um, also, the offering on the bottom of the page down here, it, Brenda cuts and pastes and does all kind of things on this to get this printed out, and she, she missed out. On it. Obviously, the, this offering was not for May 23rd. This was last Sunday. So we appreciate your giving, and um, there are boxes here and in the fellowship hall if you feel led to give to this ministry and there's one there are two other things I want you to consider today uh, is our deacons fund and we need to replenish that with the onset of the bitterly cold weather we've been having to help more and more people with fuel oil fuel oil and other things so we're a little low on the deacons fund so if you could maybe some of you find it in your heart to throw a twenty dollar bill in there or whatever whatever the Lord leads you to, uh, but, you know, mark it for the deacon's fund. <clears throat> also, as traditionally is done when we have guest speakers, uh, we will have an offering plate on the back table back there where Bill is sitting and that guy named Dave, uh, and you can drop a, whatever you want in the plate to help cover his expenses because he had to drive, what, three hours? And he's got to drive three hours back, so we help, try to help cover expenses and, and a little extra when we can. And... Is there anything else, deacons? Brenda? Seems like I wrote something. Okay, I got that. I got that. I, I, I tell you what they give me. <laughs> so, now I'd like you to join me in welcoming our guest, Dave Mumford. He's no stranger around here. He's been coming here for years. And he usually comes and sings a bunch and then brings a message. But we dropped the ball in communication, and I assumed he was coming to sing, so we had no songs planned. So what we did just a few minutes ago was kind of thrown together, but it worked. It worked out. Um, but Dave's got a, a, a word from God, and uh, I welcome you, brother. All right. you, now you've got to yell. Well, that's a good thing. No tomatoes yet, so that's a good thing. Here you go, Dave. Yep. Figure out how to wear this. How y'all doing? I'll say that from the south. How y'all doing? Lived there for two years in Lebanon, but the locals call it Lebanon, Lebanon, Tennessee. And it was hot. I remember when we first moved in there, we put a mobile home on the lot that we had bought, and they came to set it up, and I said, what are you doing? They said, well, we're getting ready to hook up your AC. I said, AC? I said, we don't need AC here. They said, what are you going to do? I said, well, we're from Maine. We'll just open up the windows and let her blow cold. And he said, you ain't all from around here, are you? I said, no. He said, you're going to need that AC. 
Well, he wasn't joking because we ran that 24-7 when we were there. But I'm looking forward to the warmth that's coming, right? No matter what we're going through, the hardships and difficulties, there's a brighter day coming. And for us as believers, which is hard sometimes, we get our eyes on the temporal and we forget about the eternal. And when you're going through hardships and difficulties, which if you haven't, you will, trust me as a believer, and maybe you are right now, and if Christ is your Savior, there's hope. You're anchored on the rock. And people ask me, because I love to sing and travel around, they say, Dave, do you believe in rock and roll? I said, no, my rock never rolls. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We do. If I lean to the left, he's there to hold me. If I go to the right, your left, he's where to hold me. If I start stumbling back, he's there to hold me. If I start falling forward, he's there to hold me up. If the burdens get too heavy, I look up for my redemption draws nigh. If the foundation underneath me seems to be crumbling a little bit, he says what? He is our rock and our fortress, our shield and our buckler. And when we struggle internally, the Word of God tells us in Galatians 2.20, the Holy Spirit of God is with us forever. And that he will not leave us nor forsake us. And when those burdens get heavy, which they do, he tells us to look up. And he hides us under the shadow of the Almighty. And I don't know about you, if you've ever been close to someone, you have to stand awfully close to be in their shadow. Right? And sometimes we're scared of those shadows. And sometimes those shadows come in the form of fiery darts. But remember, Galatians and Ephesians talks on the whole armor of God. If you don't know that, I recommend you go to Ephesians chapter 6 and you look hard at verses 10 through 18. Girding your loins with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, shodding your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking up the shield of faith, quenching all the fiery darts of the wicked, and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Three times the Lord was tempted, wasn't he, by Satan. He never came back with a fist fight. He never argued with them. He always came back and said, Satan, it is written. Our greatest defense and offense and stability is the word of God. How many know the phrase backsliding? We're going to look at that this morning. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, please, in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 2. So if we are not holding our ground and we are not going forward, what is the result? We are backsliding. We are going backwards, right? And I think of all the things that have been happening with our culture and our society, particularly over the last two years where we've been isolated, we've caused division, we've caused schisms and all those things, and it's been one of the devil's greatest tools is to get us fighting amongst one another. This person is, that person is, and you turn on the TV today and we're not tearing the fur out of that person, we're going to soon tear it out of that one. We're ripping people's characters apart. We're accusing one another without any information, without any evidence, without any credibility. We're just throwing it out there and letting social media take it and do what they will. So if we're not tuned in to the Spirit of God and being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, the danger is we'll believe the lies that come down the pike and we will start falling back. And I'm afraid today what I'm seeing in the evangelical churches or in personal lives or families, I am seeing a falling away and a backsliding. And trust me, when you're going through a valley and a hardship, you are tempted in the flesh to turn and run the other way. The flesh is always with us. And you want to know a big secret, which is not a big secret. You are not my enemy today. You may be a friend of me. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? But you are not my enemy my brethren are not my enemy. We have a real enemy. It's the powers and principalities of the air. He loves to throw the fiery darts of division, of schisms, and all of those things that he loves to throw to break the unity up of what? The body of believers or families or workplaces or whatever. He loves to cause division, and his main ministry is to kill, steal, and destroy. So be very careful on this fact. When you have goodly homes, you have much in your bank account, 
when you have a great home and everything's going okay, be very careful because the enemy doesn't like you staying there. And the danger I find when we have it all together, we don't look to God in the urgency that we need to because as Pastor Russ said, we are here today not by happenstance or chance. We are here by the appointment of the grace of God. I am here today, and I get up every day, and when I do and I'm awake and alive, it is solely by the grace of God. The unmerited favor of God and the mercy of God is what he gives us each and every day. And if that's all you have to hang on to, you thank him for that. And sometimes that's all we have. When everything else is breaking loose, Lord, I thank you for so great a salvation. Because it is a good salvation. Right? He's too holy. He's too righteous. Listen to me. Listen to me very carefully to make a mistake. It doesn't make sense. It's not lining up. God's not asking us to go by feelings. He's asking us to trust Him by faith. What is fear? False evidence appearing real. It looks too bad for me. It's never going to turn out. It'll never come together. The fiery darts. But God says, look beyond that. Look unto me, the author and finisher of your faith, and trust me by faith. And here's what faith is. Forsake all, I trust him. So if you're going through a storm, if you're going through the fire, you're going through the flood, he's there every step of the way to hold our hands. But God allows us to make choices. We have a will, right? It doesn't create robots. I have a will, you have a will. I could have got up this morning and said, you know what? It's minus 55 in Dover Foxcroft, I'm not coming today. I'm just going to stay cuddled in my bed. But I said, no, Lord, you want me to go. I'm choosing to go and to be ministering and to be ministered to. Thank God I made that choice. What I would have missed out on is seeing your smiling faces. All right, everybody just smile back at me because you're not smiling. You look like you've been baptized in dill pickle juice. Some of you are new. Nice to see new faces. It's good to be in the house of God. I need God's people. You need me. I need you. We are a family. So in Jeremiah chapter 2, it's some snapshots of the family of God, but also it's a danger as well that we need to be reminded of looking back at the promises of God, but also the consequences if we do not obey God. And there are consequences. What I sow today, I may reap today. If I drive from here and I go through, I'm not sure the name of it, but the Indian township, right over here, and I break that speed limit, what's going to happen if they pull me over? They're going to get me, and I'll have to pay the consequences for breaking the speed limit. Right, Dave? Yes. I am guilty as sin. They may let me go and show me mercy, but I've been pulled over before, and I've been shown mercy. <laughs> but sometimes we're pulled over, and I have to pay the consequences to a lead foot. So the last two things that actually get saved on someone is a right foot in their wallet. You'll get that in a minute. <clears throat> We're under grace, but grace does not give me the license to sin. And if you look in the Old Testament, many a times with the nation of Israel, God warned them, when these things accumulate and you get all this stuff on you, be very, very careful not to forget God. Do you know what we're missing today? And we'll look at our text here in a moment. Personal accountability. Someone else made me do it. Matter of fact, the devil made me do it. Really? Well, someone goes in, he riddles bullets into a postal situation, they say it's the gun's fault. It's not the gun's fault. It's the person wielding the weapon that causes the damage. So I cannot blame the enemy for the things that I do to get away from my personal accountability. I love Psalm 51. David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Own up to our responsibilities. When I blow it, repent. That is biblical Christianity. When I've fallen short, admit to it. Say, God, I've blown it. Forgive me, restore me, and keep on keeping on. Today in our society, we're blaming everyone else except taking responsibility for our own actions. And all these things happen. But a lot of times I'm responsible for who I am. Looking in this mirror, I'm accountable for me. And if I'm looking after me, 
You know what's going to happen? I'll start looking after you. My sin is ever before me. Thank God we have a Savior who's merciful and gracious. A mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. See, they didn't have him back in Jeremiah's day. They heard about one coming. But the pictures and types we find in the Old Testament are a snapshot of the Messiah that's going to come in the flesh and fulfill what he promised to do. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there is no salvation in any other. So look what it says, Jeremiah chapter 2. I'll get a little more light on the subject. Verse 2 of Jeremiah chapter 2. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord. I love that phrase, mentioned over 3,600 times in the Word of God. So God doesn't stumble. He doesn't make a mistake. Thus saith the Lord. It says this, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thy espousals. When thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that thou was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the firstfruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Your pastor said this this morning. Are you coming? Expecting to hear from the Lord? I hope you are, because you don't know what's coming this week. And the nuggets that are shared this morning, applied by the Spirit of God, when that situation comes up, what do you think he'll do? He'll bring to your remembrance what you heard this morning. Through a song, through a word, through a testimony. So pay attention. Lord, give me ears to hear, a heart that's open. Because you know what's coming and I don't. And I need you every minute of every hour. And it goes on to say in verse 4, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O host of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord... What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are come, become vain? Neither, say they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through the land of the deserts and of pits, through the land of drought, through the shadow of death, through the land that no man passes through, and where no man dwell? God's bringing them through the wilderness, isn't he? He promised them. He promised he would bring them out. And he'd make them what? A holy nation unto himself. And that's still God's promise. You know that? He's going to do that. It's coming. And he goes on to say, And I brought you into the plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and make my inheritance an abomination. It's an interesting word there, abomination. It's what it simply means. This, God has packed his bags and he's getting ready to move. When God gets to the place where he has reached, where he's reached, then God is going to move, and here's what happens. On a nation or an individual, there is no stopping it. But yet God in his mercy and his grace raises up the level of judgment what is appropriate for a nation or for an individual. Because God knows our frame. He knows how frail and weak we are. He knows how to turn up the pressure. But yet, in the word chastening, which we think that God is holding us down and whacking us so hard with a stick, but yet God in that process is not whacking us with a stick. He's doing it out of love because he loves us. But he knows how just to apply the amount of pressure we need. So what's his purpose? That we don't backslide, but we turn in repentance and start moving forward again. So Israel, in this process, was falling backwards. How do we know? Look over in verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. What are the evils? They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold what? Water. So God is saying to the nation of Israel, listen, you've committed two evils. And when we backslide, as a believer, here's what we start doing, justifying our actions. We drift from the things that are most important and which once we held to the dearest, which is the word of God and prayer and fellowship with God's people. And we start honing out cisterns for ourselves. You know what that was? They just carve it out or clay it out. They fill it full of water, right? But it would never continue to replenish it. But when it was started to get low, they had to make another one. They piped it through until this one was empty. So they just kept leapfrogging, leapfrogging, leapfrogging. So it could never replenish. It was never clean, pure water, right? It would never 
fill itself up. They had to do it by hand. And God says you're like broken cisterns. And I think he's saying that to the church today. In the lives today. You look good. You smell good. You taste good. You got everything going for you. But thou lackest one thing. You're forgetting your first love. And the evidence of loving God, listen to me, will show up for a love for the unlost, the unsaved, but a love for God's people. And a love for thy neighbor as thy love thyself. God says it hangs on two commandments. Love thy Lord thy God with what? All your heart, soul, strength, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Love covers a multitude of sins, and God is getting Israel's attention by love. It's his agape love. You know what it is? I mentioned it a few minutes ago. We have a will. We muster up a phileo, filio love, which means, you know what, Lord? I love you. He said that to Peter three times around the campfire, didn't he? Peter, thou lovest me? You know I do, Lord. By then, the third time, Peter was getting agitated. Wasn't he? Because it was a human love. You know I love you, Lord. But God's agape love is this. It's an, listen to me. It's an act of God's own will. Listen to me. In spite of who we are, sinners and lost and broken, God loves you. And God loves me. And this is the thing. You can't do a blessed thing about it. <laughs> he just loves you. And he just loves me. God does everything out of love. To us today, that's sort of a foreign concept, isn't it? So what is backsliding? As I take a drink of water, who would like to give a definition of backsliding? Anyone here? In biblical terms, what is it? We're pulling back from truth. Right? He that knoweth to do good, doeth it not to him it is sin. So if I know to do good according to the word of God and I do not do it, that means what? God's word is not moved. My rock never rolls. It remains the same. What am I doing? I'm pulling back from the word of God. I know what it says, but, Lord, when I throw in the but, I'm in trouble. God says, do this, bon appetit. He says, do this, stay away, warning, stop, do not do it. I suffer the consequences. What a man soweth, what a man's going to reap. It's a simple process, but you throw a rock up, what's going to happen? That rock's going to come down. Sooner or later, it's going to come down. What goes up is going to come down. Jump off a building, what's going to happen? I'm going to go down. I'm going to test gravity. I'm coming down. <laughs> it's the laws of nature. It's the laws of physics. God is a God of laws. My precepts, my statutes, and my laws. You know what he did to Israel? Here's the Ten Commandments. Do it, and you'll be okay. God knew they were going to break the Ten Commandments. And if we break one, we're guilty of all. Right? So what is the Ten Commandments? It's a snapshot of the Savior who's going to come and fulfill that. So salvation is not found in the law. Salvation is found in the Lord. It's a personal relationship with Christ. And why did these two evils start to happen? Because they drifted from Jehovah God. And us as believers, when we get our eyes on the temporal, we don't say focus on the eternal, what happens? I start to drift from God. And the things that were precious and dear to me, I get further away and I start hearing less of his voice. I become hardened and calloused. I've met so many Christians that they say they love the Lord, but they hate their brother. Or they're so filled with bitterness. And that is not of God. How can I say I love God but hate my brother? The two can't mix. Only God can balance love and hate at the same time because he's God. But I ought to hate the things that God hates. I hate division. I hate schisms. Indignation we ought to be filled with. Thou shalt not kill when a baby's ripped out of the womb. I'm angry. That's life. Thou shalt not kill. But that doesn't justify my actions to go in and take the life of the one that killed the baby. See, we cross a line there when we do that. Israel crossed the line. And they crossed the line that God says, please don't forget me. And the byproduct of them forgiving always doesn't show up in righteousness. It shows up in evil behavior. So whatever is in the well, 
Sue's going to come up into the bucket. Isn't that true? Character follows the conduct, and the conduct follows the character. So going on with our text, and we'll look at a few things here this morning. Verse 8, the priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew it not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal. And they walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore I yet you plead ye with me, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of the Chittim, and see, and send unto Chedar, and consider dills, and see such as the thing that I will do. Have the nation changed their gods, which are yet not gods? But my people have changed their glory for their which they do not profit. So what does God desire from our lives? To sit sour and soak? Nope. God's purpose for our lives as believers is to glorify Him. Even if it's unpopular to the country or to other people, because listen, majority is not always in the right. The minority is in Scripture is in the right. The spies, when in the spied out the land, two gave a good report. Listen to me. Ten didn't. What happened? Were they said no in disobedience? Forty years later, where did God bring them back to? The same place they said no. You know, there are believers, I'm convinced, that said no to God a long time ago. And they're still in the wilderness. God's still putting shoes on their feet. Manna from heaven. But yet they're as empty as, empty as a gun barrel. The joy of the Lord is not their strength. They're just living life and not enjoying the fruits of the labor of what God's called them to do. Many believers are sit sour and soaking because where they said no, where God has to bring it back around where they'll say yes. I thank God. Listen to me. I thank God for the chastening hand of God in my life. It's an evidence that he loves me and I belong to him. If there's no chastening, here's the warning shot. You may not belong to him because God knows how to deal with his children. It's interesting. In this text, God was telling them to bring forth good grapes. But they were bringing forth bad groups, grapes. And if you ever visited a vineyard, the pastor has, that they lay low and they get in the dirt and the dust and the vineyard dresser has to come along, clean around the dust and the dirt, and he's got to trim away the stuff that's not good. So what will happen? They'll spring back up so they'll be able to grow lush and beautiful. And this is what I love about the Lord. He likes to prune our lives to bring forth that which he desires. But if I dig my heels in, you know what he's got to do? He's got to prune a little bit harder. And I can say to him, God, stop it. I've had enough. But you know what? God knows when to stop, and he knows when I've had enough. You ever said that to God, and he's never answered you back? God, I've had enough. I can't take any more. But God continues to do it, because why? He's seeing it from an eternal perspective. There's where faith comes in. And we let go of the feelings. So just five things I want to talk on briefly this morning. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me? That they have gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and have become vain. There's things I've written down. Listen to this in regards to backsliding. God is not responsible for mine and your backsliding. That's your choice and my choice. Verse 5. They're trying to blame it. Thus saith the Lord. Here's the Lord speaking to him. What iniquity have your fathers found in me? If I'm God and too holy and too righteous to make a mistake, well, you've got to throw that excuse out the window. Who is God? He's holy and righteous. He's perfect. So God can't mis do that. God, God can't force on me backsliding. That's my personal choice. He that knoweth to do it good, and doeth it not, and to him it is sin. So I make the choice. I know what God says. Stay away. I know what he says is good. Go for it. But I enact my will, and I say, God, I'm going to do it anyway. 
And then what happens? Here's what happens. God gets at our conscience. God brings conviction. And if I don't turn, you know where it shows up? In my character. That's what happens in the process of when I don't obey. Look at Joseph. What a beautiful picture and typology of Christ. He did everything right, but yet, what? He was thrown in prison? And the rascal forgot about him for two more years. His family threw him under the bus. They lied that he was torn up by animals. The heartbreak he brought to his dad. But yet he stuck to the stuff. He obeyed God, left the consequences with him. And look what God did in his life. It's never wrong to do right. Never wrong to do right. But don't you dare, don't I dare ask God to bless my sin. Because he won't do it. If I know it's not right and I say, God, everybody else is doing it, it must be right, it's not right. Thus saith the Lord. Number two. Same verse. It goes on to say in verse 5, I'll say the latter part of B, just for a heading. It says this, And have walked after vanity, and have become vain. Number two, God is not responsible, listen to me, for mine and yours empty life. Look what it says over here in verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, and the what? The fountain of living Waters. Who's the living water? Who's the Jesus? Right? Is his mercies new each day? Great is his faithfulness. Don't we drink from the living waters? So if I'm not drinking from the living waters, you know what happens? My life becomes stagnant. I start building cisterns. I start trying to find pleasure and satisfaction in things that are the opposite of God's character. Christians are living like that today. It's terrible. There's no power in the life. We know what the Word says, but there's no power. I have met people in my Christian life over 30-some years now that I know they got the power. I stopped on the way here in Topsfield. I visited an 88-year-old lady, and I walk in through that door, and I can sense the presence of God. And I hugged her, and I said, give me some of that virtue. Would you pray for me today? And she said, I'll pray for you, Dave. 88 years old. And the evidence of the Lord in her life, I wanted to hang there for a long time in her presence. When was the last time you had a believer in your life you just wanted to hang out with them? Because they're so filled with God. Boy, I'm looking hard today for them. They're becoming distant in the land. We're in trouble, folks. We're falling backwards. We're not holding our ground and we're not advancing. And I want to say this, as much as he puts into it, as much as I put into it, what we do here today cannot feed you for the rest of the week. Your personal relationship with Christ is where you need to be. Get into the word yourself and say, search me, God, and know me. Keep me clean. Keep me focused. If it means afflictions, Lord, or troubles, bring it into my life because I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to leave the one in whom I love. Number three, verse six. Neither saith they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and of pits, through the land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passes through, and where no man dwelt. So now they're bringing accusations. And it says this, God is not responsible, listen to me, or for you seeking him. God requires us that we seek him with all of our heart. Where is he? Where's God right now? Where's, where's the Savior right now? Seated on the throne of grace, ever living to intercede for you and me. But my desire every day is to get up and seek the Lord while he may be found. Before I left here this morning, I get up early and I get on my knees and I sought the Lord. We build that into our lives daily, a personal, quiet time with Christ. Get alone with God. 
And you know what's so hard for us today? Listen to me very carefully. Be still and know that I am God. We cannot handle quietness. It drives us up the wall. We went to a hockey game yesterday in Dover. I don't even know why half those parents come. I'm watching them. They're not even watching their kid. They're doing this. They don't even have chins until they look up. You just go like this. I'm thinking, why are you even here? It's robbing us, listen to me, of delayed gratification. Be still and know I'm God. And there's a sweetness in the broken completeness. And that's where we hear God when we're quiet before him. I'm here, Lord. I just want to be quiet. Speak to my heart. And you know what comes? It's the still, soft voice. I'm here. I love you. I will see you through. Trust me. And you know what? I can look back over 30 years of being a believer, and I can emphatically say this. God has never, ever, 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 ever let me down. He has never failed me once. Have I? Oh, you bet your bottom dollar. But God still continues to what? Work on that. He will complete what he has started. Huh? Is God committed to you? Maybe he's looking for a little bit more commitment from us. And I guarantee you this. You get alone with God and surrender your life to God and yield it to God, you watch what God will do. The joy of the Lord will be your strength. And not trying to build these cisterns and fill it here and fill it here. If I just get bigger and better. I started working for a company probably a month ago. I'm hoping to get licensed. It's modern pest control services. Like number three in the nation. And I didn't know of such a place up way up north called Toe the Boot. Maybe you've heard of that? Way up beyond Greenville. We go up there and we service these homes. I didn't even know that place existed. Private runways. We go into these camps. They're called. These camps are $5 million. They call them camps. Radiant heat floors. I mean, I went in there, I needed a GPS, had to get back out. And Dave's saying, oh, yeah, this is one of three. I said, are you kidding me? He said, oh, no, these people got more money up here. They know what to do with. But you know what he says when I service their homes? They're tearing the fur out of one another. They have a house, but they don't have a home. We can have all the goodly stuff, but they're still drinking out of broken cisterns. No matter what happens in your life as a believer, though no one join you, you keep on keeping on. Number four, verse seven, almost done. 500 words a minute, got us up to 1,000. Here we go. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land. And made mine inheritance an abomination. Well, how did they do that? Verse 13. What did they do? Two evils. Forsook God, right? The living water, and they hound out systems for themselves. We are not trusting in the sufficiency of God. Do you know when we cry out to God? When we're going down the icy roads and we're spinning out of control and you say, Lord, please save me. And then when it nudges up against a snowbank and everything's okay and the kids are okay, you know what we don't do? We don't thank God. So even before that spinning starts, you need to thank God. You need to thank Him this morning. You have breath. You have health. You have food on your table. Shoes on your feet. A roof over your head. Warmth. You need to thank Him for the simplicity of life. Because you know what? God is the author of breath and life. And this could be my last day on earth. But God wants me to finish well. And you know what happened to these people? And what God says will kill a camp, and what will kill a church, and will kill an individual life? When I become grumbly hateful, instead of humbly grateful. God loves an attitude of gratitude. But Israel became what? Oh, the stinking manna again. 
I'm going to eat this stuff again. Oh, the heat. Oh. But it, he became unthankful. Let me ask you a question. Do you think we're an unthankful generation today? <laughs> we visit these places, advertisements all over, hiring immediately, looking for workers. In my day, I'm 54. We didn't go into a place and say, if you just show up, I'll pay you for just showing up. If you didn't show up, you were out of there. Now this younger generation today, they want all the perks and that of the owners, and if they don't get it, they walk out the door. We are creating today an entitlement society. And you know what? We're hidden just like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what brought them down? It wasn't because of the abomination and the sin. That was a byproduct. But you know what? They had everything in abundance, and they got lazy. So if we create a welfare state, you know what's going to happen? We're going to become very lazy in our character and our conduct. And being a believer is being a believer who's diligent. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. But he that comes to God must believe that he is and is rewarded to those who what? Diligently seek him. Your number one priority as a believer is to diligently seek him and leave the consequences up to God. So what is it? God is not responsible for a defiled land. Verse 7. They defiled the land. Our country is going to hell in a hen basket. We are responsible for the defilement of the land. We are backing away from the things that are right and good. Do you know how many believers I know today that are saying, I'm not going to vote anymore? What's the use? You have a constitutional right to vote, exercise it. Why do I take that seriously? Because I'm from Canada, and it doesn't work that way. I have a responsibility to vote. And what am I teaching my children coming up through? Exercise your right to vote. Follow Romans 13. We are falling back in the things that God says are good and right. Matter of fact, God has, what, blessed this land with theology. And you know what's happening? We're replacing it with neology. What's in it for me? <laughs> Instead of this, it's for the glory of God. Last one, verse 8. This is just the introduction. And the priest said not, where is the Lord? And the hand of the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Just a little side note. We walk after the things of the world, I guarantee you they're going to leave you empty and void and full of darkness. Oh, they'll bring pleasure for a bit. But you know what? These things we grab and we hold and we do, sooner or later they're going to break, aren't they? Huh? But with God, He never breaks. He never stumbles. He never falters. Here's the last one. You're not going to like this. God is not responsible for corrupt leadership. we don't get engaged as God's people and live right, we're playing into that role of evilness to take the Lord. And we're believing the lie that, boy, if I stand up for truth, I'm going to get smacked. But I'd rather side and suffer for righteousness sake than follow the crowd and go with what they're telling me. When God saved me in 1991, I no longer belonged to myself. I'm a bond servant of the living God and he's marked me. And I'd rather leave this earth doing what's right for God than failing him somewhere along the line and saying, you know what, I didn't finish well. God wants us to finish well because he's coming. And he's coming soon. So the question lies in this. Where are we at today in our personal relationship with the Lord? And modernizing that today and closing... If we would have looked over into the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, we won't go there. But when the Word of God is preached and taught, we have responsibility. We're either going to turn to it or turn away. And what we're seeing across our land today 
We're heaping up teachers that will give us what we need. Right? Or what we want instead of what we need. I'll forget all about being here today, 10, 15 years down the road. But God hasn't. And when I stand before him someday, he may bring this up again when I stand before the Bema seat. And you'll be there. The responsibility you have and I have is this. Am I going to adhere or am I going to keep going back? And I want to tell you, if we keep backsliding, it has no good results. But the problem is, you just don't take yourself along for the ride. You bring others with you. Evil company corrupts good morals. And oh boy, do we need people today of good morals and good godly character. You know, you have to sign 15 pages of contracts today and give a blood sample and pee in a cup. <laughs> Whatever happened, Pastor, to the good old fashioned, I trust you by your word. Lay the handshake there and I trust you. See the character decline? The further we get away from God, the more the character's going to go in decline. But that's no excuse for us to follow suit and to play in that game. My responsibility is to keep on keeping on for Christ. Amen? Pastor, I'm finished. You need to repent. Thank you for that word, Dave. It was a good word. Amen. What are you doing with my Won't work. <laughs> Did I leave out any announcements earlier that you can think of? Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you to keep Dave in your prayers. He's got a lot going on in his life right now. And um, he's a man of God, and we love him, and, and uh, you're welcome back here anytime. I'm going to start getting here a little more often, I think, because I like getting a break. <laughs> uh, we'll still be having a Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting. Not yet sure who's going to lead it, because Karen and I will be away for our anniversary for a couple of days uh, if we don't get snowed out or snowed in whichever the case may be. So think about what Dave said. I'm not going to re-preach his sermon, but uh, that personal walk with Christ. Man, you know, a lot of things become old or habit or you just get tired of it, um, different hobbies or interests that you might have. But when you're pursuing Christ, that never gets old. It just gets better. If you're seriously in pursuit of that close relationship with him and you stick to it best you can, it'll, it's like he says, his mercies are new every morning. It really is. So I want to encourage you on that. And that's a theme that we've been harping on a lot in some of our teaching and preaching. So, you know, the Lord's honoring that. So I'm, I'm grateful and humbled. We ready with our closing song? Please stand and sing the doxology with us. <laughs>